So, dear participants, uh, my name is Lea Margot. I'm program manager at uh, ER, ERN Eurobloodnet, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, on behalf of the European Hematology Association and uh, the ERN Eurobloodnet to the fourth uh, webinar, uh, EHA and ERN Eurobloodnet Spotlight on Castleman disease. So this is an accredited European online educational program targeting uh, health professionals and co-organized by uh, the EHA and the ERN Eurobloodnet. So uh, this program consists of four sessions focused on Castleman disease, uh, and it is accredited by four CME points uh, of the European Board of, uh, for accredita Accreditation in Hematology. So each session is one credit, uh, so you can get four credits uh, for the full program or require only one credit associated to the lecture uh, you have ass assisted to. Uh, so how to get these uh, points? Uh, so please first pay attention uh, that you have insert your full name and surname in the Zoom platform. Uh, and also please at the end of the session, you are going to receive a survey. Uh, it is mandatory to answer this survey in order to get the accreditation because this is the, the way uh, we can track your presence to, to the webinar. Uh, so, uh, before starting, still some technical information. The session is uh, recorded because uh, it will be implemented on the EHA and Eurobloodnet e-learning environment. So, if you don't feel uh, at your ease about that, you can uh, put off your camera and uh, also uh, put your microphone uh, off during the presentation. If you have questions, you can address them uh, in the chat and we will uh, address them uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, so as I said, uh, today is the last lecture of uh, the, the webinar program uh, on Castleman disease. Um, so this lecture is more uh, specifically uh, on Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus associated multicentric Castleman disease and uh, HHV8 associated multicentric Castleman disease. Um, so uh, I will first introduce you uh, the first uh, speaker of today, uh, David Budbul, who is uh, with us uh, today and who will start this uh, this webinar. So. Uh, Professor David Boudboul graduated uh, at the University Paris Descartes in 2008 after uh, a residency in clinical immunology. He studied the genetic basic of uh, CVID associated lymphoproliferative disorders during his uh, PhD and joined the Institute Imagine for a postdoctoral fellowship uh, studying genetics of uh, EBV susceptibility and Icarus uh, germline mutations in uh, children with primary immune deficiencies. Uh, he's now associate professor in the clinical immunology unit at uh, Hospital Saint Louis in Par Paris. And he recently developed a research activity leading a team working on the pathophysiology of Kasselman disease. Uh, so please, Professor Boudboul, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me to, to speak about the pathophysiology of um, uh, a particular subtype of multicentric Kasselman disease that is a subtype that is uh, caused by a herpes virus called KSHV or HHV8. And I will use uh, HHV8 today for the presentation. Uh, so, uh, First, to, to give some words about the HHV8. HHV8 is a herpes virus, as you can see here on the evolutionary tree, and it's uh, relatively close to ABV, and there is a, a subtype of HHV8 in the, in the monkey, so uh, we can do some experiments in the monkey if, if we want. Uh, this herpes virus is a double-stranded DNA virus, with a size of 160 uh, kilo, uh, kilo bars. And there are um, several conserved genes within the herpes family, but there are also specific genes that are specific to this virus, um, named the K genes. And this virus managed to modify the host using cellular homologs in both categories, 
I can uh, quote the presence of the viral IL-6 or a viral cyclin. So uh, there are cellular homologs uh, coded by the virus. As I told you before, this, vir uh, this virus uh, shares some similarity with EBV uh, because it has a latent and a lytic cycle, and it can also infect the B cells and lead to the development of malignancy. So uh, how do we get HHV-8? Um, there are some countries that uh, are highly prevalent in uh, HHV-8, uh, that, that are the Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, the West Indies, and the people get infected by the saliva when they uh, are a child. Uh, we also get uh, a high, highly prevalent uh, uh, in the European countries that are um, men who have sex with men uh, getting infected uh, more uh, later in the life. Uh, so, oh, sorry, um, uh, the HHVA can infect several uh, cells. Uh, first, uh, the endothelial cells, uh, also the epithelial cells and the keratinocyte using different receptors, heparin sulfate, integrin, and uh, the most more recently described ifa 2 r But this virus, as I told you before, and this is a commonality with the ABV, can also infect the B cell and the monocyte using a particular receptor uh, that it caused DC sign. This receptor was uh, studied uh, during the HIV uh, infection because it helped the virus to get inside the host. And HHV-8 also use uh, this receptor to get inside the cell. There are various endocytic pathways, and the, the goal of the virus is, is to infect the cell and to establish a latency. And as you can see here, uh, you get the virus, virus um, entering the cell um, um, uh, and uh, liberating the, the DNA. Uh, you have uh, the next step that is the circular, uh, circularization of the DNA. Uh, and we call it an episome, and the episome will be fixed to the host chromatin uh, with a, a very important uh, protein coded by the virus that is called LANA or latent nuclear antigen. And this LANA allow the, the, the binding of the episomal virus to the chromatin and the establishment of the latency. And the virus will um, uh, use the host machinery to get, uh, uh, to get uh, replicated. As you can see here, uh, we do a staining on um, HHV-8 infected uh, cell line that are called uh, BCP1. We, do, we did a staining with LANA, as I told you before, uh, the protein that coded for a latent nuclear antigen. And we co-stain the cell with the IKZF1, that is a marker of pericentromeric heterochromatin. And what you can see, you have a lot of uh, spot uh, of LANA, but every spot uh, of uh, IKZF1 is um, co-stained with LANA, meaning that LANA is at least uh, fixed to the heterochromatic, the pericentromeric heterochromatic. And we don't know yet how to go from a latent to the lytic uh, cycle, because when we activate the cell to induce the lytic phases, we, uh, we saw the same pattern. So LANA is described as a latent nuclear antigen, but when we do some activation, LANA is still in the cell. The spots are uh, the same in number, uh, in localization. So we don't know uh, if la LANA is, is a true latent antigen or a pan antigen uh, related to uh, the infection of the cell by the virus. So there are two um, sch uh, schematic uh, uh, cell cycle. The first one is a latent one with the expression of LANA with the, the, the pitfall I, I told you before. And the marker of a lytic cycle is RTA, expressed very early when the, the lytic cycle is activated. We know very well how to induce the lytic cycle in vitro using uh, hypoxia, butyrat, uh, HDAC inhibitors. But in the host, we don't know what uh, 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 lead to uh, the expression of the lytic cycle in the virus. There are other proteins um, known to be associated with the lytic phases of the virus, but it's not so clear as for LANA. So what are HHV-8 associated disease? Uh, the first thing I should uh, tell you is that you get a problem with HHV-8 
when you have an immune deficiency and mainly a secondary immune deficiency uh, that are uh, related to HIV infection uh, or post-transplant um, uh, period. Um, we, as you will see, when looking at primary immune deficiency in children, um, it hasn't been described associated with HHV8 or very few primary immune deficiency uh, have been linked to uh, Kaposi or Castleman emergence. So when you have an immunodepression, that is a broad term, uh, you can have problem with HHV8. The first problem is the HHV8 primary infection. Um, when you, have, you are immunocompetent, you are getting infected by HHV8, HHV you don't have any symptoms, uh, maybe flu sometime, but uh, no more. But when you are immunosuppressed, you can have a very um, inflammatory reaction with uh, the development of hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis that can um, uh, um, uh, be life-threatening. The other condition are the well-known Kaposi sarcoma, uh, which uh, is due to the infection of the endothelial cell by the HHV8. Um, some lymphoma, uh, because as I told you before, uh, HHV8 can lead to uh, the development of uh, malignancy uh, as uh, a BV uh, does. And today we will focus on a lymphoproliferative disorder, that is a, a disease of a lymph node that, has, that, that is not monoclonal, uh, Castleman disease is not, is not a lymphoma, um, and that is due to the targeting of the B cells by HHV8. So what is HHV8 multicentric Castleman disease? If you follow the previous session, um, it's uh, a patient presenting with um, uh, altered general status with uh, high-grade fever and sometimes HLH, as uh, Mark will uh, tell you uh, uh, later. And when you did, uh, when you do, you do a biopsy of a lymph node, you see the particular aspects of Castleman disease that are a regressed germinal center with uh, increased vascularity. And the particularity of HHV8 positive multicentric Castleman disease is the evidence of HHV8 in situ infection. And you can uh, show this infection using uh, staining with LANA, uh, the latent nuclear antigen, showing that several cells in the mental zone are infected by HHV8. Uh, if you have these two aspects, you can say that the patient has HHV8 positive multicentric Castleman disease. Um, it was interesting because um, the, uh, the, the author wanted to describe the phenotype of these cells, and they used the immunohistochemistry, uh, and they show that the cells that were infected were almost lambda, uh, presented with a monotypic restriction. And when they saw that, they, they thought that the Castleman disease could be a lymphoma because when you think you have a monotypic disorder, you think it's monoclonal. But here you will see there is an immune paradox. Also, all the cells are lambda positive. When you do a BCR rearrangement, you show that the, BCR, the, the B cells are polyclonal. So it's strange because you have a monotypic uh, aspect of the cell, but a polyclonal uh, B cells. So, the, what we wanted to know in the lab and uh, in, in our team also is the, what are the aspects that, that um, drive the emergence of the disease. The first aspect is the B cell side, which cells are infected by HHV8, and what are the drivers that drive the, the uh, infected cell toward a uh, plas, uh, uh, plasma plastic uh, infection. And the, the other part is, as we can see, this disease is immunosuppressed host. What are the T cell determinants? What are exactly the, the immune deficiency leading to the emergence of this B cell lymphoproliferation? Now, if we look at uh, the B cell side of HHV MCT in details, um, we used, uh, the, the author uh, used uh, immunohistochemistry. As I told you before, all the infected cells were lambda. Um, these cells were IgM positive, so it, it appears to be some kind of uh, naive cell or, uh, that didn't uh, undergo um, uh, uh, class switch recombination. The CD27 was partly positive. Uh, they express, some, exp some express the viral IL-6, but all the cells uh, express the human IL-6 receptor. There was no EBV integration in those cells. I think it's a very uh, important point because when you uh, find, uh, when you have a diagnosis of 
uh, HHV8 uh, positive MCD and the cell both stain HHV8 and EBV, it's not the good diagnosis and you should um, uh, discuss with the pathology uh, unit again to exclude over uh, HHV8 lymphoproliferation. So um, we were interested in getting both cells to, to uh, analyze the phenotype in details, but it was not so easy because uh, we just have uh, had access to the lymph node and uh, lymph node, uh, you, you, you're not always um, taking all the lymph nodes, you're doing a biopsy. So we had an, an hypothesis uh, that the, when pa the patient are um, in uh, HHV8 uh, positive MCD flare, we can detect in the blood the same cells as we, we see in the lymph node. So we tested that hypothesis. Uh, we worked with the pathology team and Veronique Menian, and she uh, did uh, LANA staining on the peripheral blood of a patient with a MCD uh, related to HHV8 uh, to HHV8 flare, and she showed that we could detect infected cells uh, in the peripheral blood. We do the same uh, in the lab. Uh, Grégoire Frémont, uh, uh, master of student, did that, and he could show that in the blood of the patient we could detect um, infected cell, and that those cells were IgM positive just as it was shown in the lymph node. So it appeared that the cell that we detected during the HHV8 uh, flares was the one that we, we had in the lymph node. So it was a very uh, a magic uh, and wonderful opportunity to get those cell using um, blood drawing. So we analyzed in detail, uh, in detail the phenotype of those cells, and we show that it was the case, the cell described in the lymph node by the pathologist were detected, de detectable in the blood of patients with MD, MCT flare in more than 80% of the cases. And those cells were uh, large cells. Um, and the disease, uh, the Castleman disease linked to HHVS, as you may know, is called plasmablastic uh, Castleman disease because the cells are large. Um, this cell were uh, IgM and CD38, just as uh, shown in the histology. Uh, B cells were CD24 negative. And when we look at B cell marker, there, was, there were some B cell marker. Maybe it has a sense because as you may know, and as Mark will uh, tell you um, after, the patients are currently treated with rituximab. And maybe when, you, when we use the rituximab, we target the, the B cell uh, compartment of all these plasma plastic cells, um, and maybe it could explain the particular efficacy of the rituximab uh, during uh, HHV related MCD. These cells were mainly lambda, CD27 uh, partial, and they didn't express the CD40. So um, we could use this test in a panel of patients with suspicion of MCD flare with a good specificity and a good uh, uh, sensitivity. And we are now trying to submit a manuscript to say that the detection of those particular cells uh, could be an, uh, a useful uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tool uh, for the patient with MCD flare. Because they, we, you cannot uh, always do a biopsy, um, uh, in part, uh, in, uh, in particularly in the case when patients get HLH, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, that is a complication of uh, HHV8 MCD flare, and they had a coagulation disorder if they couldn't get the biopsy. So it could be interesting. And we also look at the detailed phenotype and compare the phenotype of, of the HHV8 infected cell with the phenotype of normal plasma blast. But plasma blast you can get after an infection or a vaccination, and we use the COVID pandemics to get some blood of patients with a, um, a COVID or a COVID vaccine. And we could show that the phenotype of the conventional plasma blast found in the reactive condition uh, were not the same as the plasma blast, the so-called plasma blast found in the MCD flare. So. I think the, the cells could be, should be uh, uh, called uh, in the circulating cell, KSHV infected cell, but the term plasma blast is, uh, is, probably, is probably wrong because they didn't get uh, all the, the markers we, uh, we, we find in the conventional plasma blast. We also performed a long time ago um, a transcriptomic analysis using microarray. We are now uh, uh, performing a single cell, and we show that the LANA cell had a particular signature, segregating for over B cell subtype and, uh, and displaying a particular plasma cell signature. 
So uh, back to the immune paradox of uh, uh, Castleman disease, as I told you before, the cells are monotypic. The cells infected by uh, HHV8 are uh, almost lambda, but they are polyclonal. And this uh, has been demonstrating in just one paper in 2001 uh, using micro dissection of um, uh, lymph node and showing that um, the repertoire of these uh, infected B cells uh, was, uh, were, uh, was polyclonal. Uh, before 2018, we didn't know what was the mechanism to induce the monotypy uh, seen in this patient. And Jennifer Totonchi uh, from the US showed that the infection of the, of the B cells in a cellular model, um, we will talking, uh, we'll talk about that later, uh, could induce um, a modification of the light chain of the B cell infected, meaning that if you infect kappa uh, B, kappa positive B cell with HHV8 uh, at day 10, the kappa uh, is down regulated and the cell uh, will start to express the lambda. So it's a very rare uh, phenomenon. It is due to the viral uh, infection. But to date, we don't know which viral proteins are doing this allelic inclusion, the editing of the uh, lambda light chain, but we are working uh, 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 on that in the lab. Uh, and to end that part, I can say uh, to you that the LANA positive cells show no somatic hypermutation. They are IgM positive with no somatic hypermutation, meaning that they, don't, that they didn't go to the germinal center. And the, it, it means that uh, the, the naive B cell could be the putative targets of HHV8 in MCT. And as I showed you before, uh, as you can see here, the, the cells are CD40 negative, but it very unusual for the B cells, and maybe the loss of the CD40 is, re is responsible for the absence of uh, isotype, isotype uh, uh, um, uh, switching, uh, and maybe that's why the cell stays in a IgM uh, positive uh, state if they don't have a somatic hypermutation. So what could be the further uh, B cell perspectives? When you have a patient uh, with a MCT flare, you will see that the HHV8 whole blood PCR is a very useful tool. And with a high replication, with a median of, of uh, 4.8 to 5. Um, but it's very, uh, uh, Castleman disease was uh, considered as a latent disease. But when you see the, the, the high viral load in this patient, you're asking if is HHV8 a purely latent disease? And we are trying to uh, analyze the lytic component of the uh, multicentric Castleman disease. It could be useful because if there is a lytic uh, part of the disease, a viral uh, part of the disease, we could use antiviral drugs to target, uh, to target the infected cells. Uh, the, the second thing is what are the host and the viral respective role in MCT pathogenesis? Um, to address that, we have developed a model of, uh, of the, the tonsil model. You take tonsil, you infect uh, them with uh, uh, HHV8. At day 10, you can have a very nice uh, uh, HHV8 uh, plasma blast, or so-called plasma blast, that you can study uh, how uh, long you want. Now we are moving uh, on the T-cell side of multicentric Castleman disease. Um, as I told you before, um, the expression of the disease is uh, mo mostly occurring in the immunosuppressed host, the HIV population, the patient who are undergoing uh, uh, transplantation. And there is a very nice paper using the homolog, the simian homolog of uh, HHV8, showing that when you infect um, uh, a monkey with uh, the simian homolog of HHV8, you don't get any Castleman disease, but when you infect uh, the monkey with the simian, uh, the SIV, the homolog of HIV, before infected with the homolog of HHV8, you get a very nice uh, Castleman disease with all the symptoms we met in the, um, in, in the humans. The other uh, rationale for uh, participation of the T cell in the control of the, the, the infected B cell uh, are coming from this publication uh, showing that in vitro, when you infect the B cell using the tonsil model I showed you before, uh, uh, when you co-culture those cells with T cells, you're uh, getting um, a, a decreasing of uh, viral replication. So there is a defect 
of, uh, of the in the T cell control of the infected B cell that are occurring uh, in the patient with uh, HHV8 positive multicentric Kasselman disease. So what is the what are the defects implied in the, the emergence of this uh, viral lymphoproliferation? And to have some hypothesis, we go back. Uh, from what is known for OBV associated primary immune deficiency. And what we know for uh, in OBV associated primary immune deficiency is what, uh, when you get children with a monogenic defect in a T cell lymphocyte uh, uh, activation and proliferation, you don't manage, you, you do not manage to control the OBV infected B cell and you get a info proliferation. So the hypothesis for HHV8 is the same, sorry is to say that uh, maybe there is a there is a, a defect of the T cell control using maybe some co uh, stimulatory molecule of sort TCR abnormalities leading to the uh, um, emergence of the HHV8 infected B cell just as we it was described uh, by this team particularly in EBV uh, susceptibility the other thing is that when you're dealing with OBV susceptibility, um, a, a frequent uh, abnormality in the, is, is seen in the peripheral blood of patients with uh, OBV associated uh, primary immune deficiency that are uh, the decrease or the absence of invariant NKT cell that are um, uh, lymphoid cell in, um, implicated in the immunosurveillance. And we looked uh, a long time ago, uh, five years ago, now. Uh, uh, at the number of INKT in uh, HHV8 uh, positive cell, and we could demonstrate that just as a BV, there was a decrease or an absence uh, uh, of uh, INKT cells in the setting of uh, HHV8 positive MCT. That could be a clue. Uh, maybe the INKT are implicated in the control of the B cells infected uh, by HHV8. Uh, we then look at the uh, HHV8 related uh, by primary immune deficiencies. And we uh, were a little bit disappointed because there are very, very, very few primary immune deficiencies associated with HHV8 disease, unlike BV. Uh, and these primary deficiencies are uh, almost always associated with Kaposi sarcoma and not MCD. But, at, but as you can notice here, OX40 deficiency, OX40 is a, is a co-stimulatory molecule. I, uh, and when you uh, uh, we, you don't have uh, any OX40 at the surface of your T cells, you cannot control the proliferation of the endophilial cell infected by HHV. So maybe there is something to explore on the co-stimulatory molecule implied in the control of the HHV8 infected cells. So what are the further T cell perspectives? When, uh, when you look at the T cell repertoire and the T cell response, uh, using um, a bank of peptide in patient with uh, Castleman disease, you see that the, the patient have a polyfunctional effector memory against uh, again HHV8 with polyfunctional uh, uh, um, HHV8 specific CD8 T cell producing a, a nice amount of interferon gamma. So maybe this is this was not the good way to address the specific response of the T cell against uh, the, the B cells infected by HHV8. And we are uh, planning to do some cell to cell experiment to see as uh, I showed you for BV, if there is a, a defect in the, in the immunological synapse. Okay, so we are done. In summary, uh, HHV8 MCD, it's a complex uh, immunological disorder affecting B and T cells oh. and sharing some uh, similarity with BV uh, driven lymphoproliferative disorder. From the B cell side, infection of naive B cell um, could lead to the emergence of lambda monotypic and naive plasma blast like cells. These cells are detectable in the blood of MCD patients and could be a useful diagnostic tool for the diagnosis of MCD. And um, there is a virally induced DNA editing of the lambda light chain that could explain the monotypic restriction uh, seen in uh, HHV8 positive multicentric Kasselman disease. From the T cell side, um, as I uh, told you, uh, HHV8 mainly occurs in a T cell deficiency setting, and these defects involve CD8, CD4, but also INKT cells. And despite polyfunctional HHV8 specific uh, CD8 T cell, defects in the in the synapse could lead to the uh, defect in the T cell proliferation against inf uh, HHV8 infected B cells. Esatto, okay. però eh, non mi pare che stai facendo i compiti. 
Allora, um, giocare va bene, vedere il caso va bene. Quando è che finisce tutto questo? Eh, bravo. So, thank you. I want, I want to Benissimo. thank the people of the lab, uh, mainly the people working on the HHV8 uh, um, uh, project, Grégoire Martin de Fremont, Silen Knapp, Silen Knapp and uh, Anthony uh, Vanjac. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for the for this presentation. Um, so thank you, Professor Budbul, for uh, staying. We will address the, the question at the end of the session. Uh, Professor Bower, I see that you are uh, well connecting. So thank you. Um, so uh, I will briefly pre present you so that uh, you can then go on um, with, uh, with your uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, for the second part uh, of the, the presentation of the session, I am pleased to uh, welcome Professor Mark Bauer. Uh, so Professor Mark Bauer is consultant uh, medical oncologist at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and professor at uh, Imperial College who uh, specializes in treatment of uh, AIDS-related malignancies. He has developed one of uh, the largest centers for the management of these tumors in Europe, receiving referrals from uh, through who the UK and has cared for over uh, 3000 patients with uh, HIV associated cancers. His clinical research covers the epidemiology, etiology, pathogenesis and management of these tumors. He has a laboratory program studying the immunopathology of these tumors in collaboration with a number of uh, scientists. And he's a scientific advisor at uh, UNEDS. So Professor Mag Bauer, uh, I'm pleased to pass you the floor. I've, I hope everything is fine. As I understand it, what we wanted to discuss today was uh, Castleman's disease in the context of uh, uh, KSHV, HHV8 infection. Okay, so this is not, of course, the disease that Castleman originally described at all. What Castleman's described, you know, the first uh, description of Castleman's disease was actually in the in the uh, center of the New England Journal of Medicine. I don't know how many of you read the New England Journal of Medicine. But um, they have uh, every edition, they have a case report of almost impossible uh, diagnoses that I never get right. But when I was a junior doctor, I always read them each week and I thought I might learn something. I never got the diagnoses right, but it, I was amazed that the specialists always got the diagnosis correct, however obscure the condition was. But this one must have been a really difficult one because the first ever description of Castleman's disease actually occurred in one of those case reports in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what he, of course, described was, uh, and here, here's a, here's, here are the images from that paper, was the uh, uh, unicentric uh, Castleman's disease. In fact, Castleman's disease now uh, is clearly a collection of very different illnesses with the same name. And today we are, I'm only going to discuss with you uh, Castleman's disease related to uh, Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus annoyingly has two names, KSHV and human herpes virus 8, so that uh, the two names are interchangeable. And the features, the diagnosis and the management of KSHV associated multicentric Castleman's disease is very, very different from all the other forms of Castleman's disease. Histologically, we have this, the, the uh, familiar uh, features of a hyperplastic uh, lymph node follicle with a, the onion skin arrangement of, uh, of uh, lymphoid cells surrounding a, uh, a blood vessel, angiofollicular hyperplasia. And here you can see a, a nice example of the of the um, uh, of the blood vessel entering the uh, the germinal center and looks like a, a lollipop on a stick really. And those lymphoid cells within the mantle zone are relatively large and have prominent uh, nucleoli, as you can see here, 
and have been termed plasma blasts. The features of those cells, which actually makes this diagnosis a much easier diagnosis to make histologically than other forms of multicentric Parsimon's disease. Those plasma blasts are always IgM restricted and are also always lambda light chain restricted. Now, the reason behind that pattern of, uh, of uh, immunophenotype is not clear, and it's not clear whether it is the presence of KSHV that directs the plasma blast to that limited uh, um, uh, expression, or whether it is the, that uh, KSHV can only infect uh, uh, IgM, uh, lambda light chain expressing uh, uh, plasma blasts is not clear. Relatively early in the uh, uh, discovery of an association between multicentric Carlson's disease and HIV, it was recognized that many patients who had HIV associated multicentric Carlson's disease were co infected with uh, 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 or also had Kaposi's sarcoma. And in fact, um, about two thirds of patients who have HI a diagnosis of HIV-associated multicentric Carlson's disease have cutaneous Kaposi's sarcoma, either prior to the diagnosis or co concomitant with the Carlson's diagnosis. And indeed, it's quite common to see within a lymph node biopsy, not just the multicentric Carlson's disease, but also focal areas of Kaposi's sarcoma Within the uh, within the lymph node, within uh, you know subcapsula often in the lymph node, and it was those two pieces of evidence that led uh, to the study of the presence of KSHV within HIV-associated multicentric Carlson's disease, and the recognition that these plasma blasts are infected by Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. Here you can see a uh, immunohistochemistry for LANA, the latent nuclear antigen of uh, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. And you can see that that is expressed in the plasma blasts in a patient with multicentric Carlson's disease. In Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, there are two uh, um, life cycles, as with all herpes viruses, there is the lytic like cycle in which lots of new viral particles are produced but the uh, host cells are destroyed and there is the latent life cycle where a minimum number of viral proteins are expressed and the major uh, in the case of Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus the major latent uh, um, gene that is expressed is called LANA the latent nuclear antigen and that uh, secures the viral episode in the uh, host cell. In patients with Kaposi's sarcoma, the vast majority of the virus is latently infecting these spindle cells. So there's not a lot of uh, viral replication and not a lot of expression of any of the lytic genes of Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. In contrast, in Castleman's disease, there's quite a lot of lytic expression of the virus. And indeed, that is almost certainly accounts for the systemic manifestations of multicentric Castleman's disease in this context, because the ORF K2 is a viral homologue a virokine of interleukin-6, and that is a lytic gene. So it's not produced in Kaposi sarcoma, where the virus is predominantly in latent form, but in multicentric Carlson's disease, where there is lytic gene expression, there's a large amount of viral IL-6 produced. And that viral IL-6 is able to activate the normal human IL-6 receptors and lead to downstream uh, effects, including um, the, uh, the 
uh, acute phase reaction. And we can see that in patients with active Castleman's disease in the context of uh, closed cell herpes virus, the levels of IL-6 are extremely high. And the majority of that IL-6 is thought to be of viral origin, although there is also some overexpression and high levels of the human form of IL-6 also generated. And as I mentioned, IL-6 predominantly an acute phase reactant leading to many of the clinical and, and uh, biological manifestations of Castleman's disease, particularly the high CRPs, uh, low albumins and uh, high fevers seen in patients with uh, KSHV associated multicentric Castleman's disease. Patients with this diagnosis have a relapsing and remitting uh, natural history, that's the biology of the disease, and the definition of an acute attack of Castleman's disease was obviously uh, coined by, uh, by Eric Oxenhendler and the ANRS, who did the, uh, uh, one of the pivotal studies on the use of uh, rituximab, and at that time they def uh, uh, produced a definition of what an acute attack of multicentric Castleman's disease was in the context of Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. And three features need to, do, to be present, a fever, a raised CRP, and at least three of, the, uh, of those 12 um, clinical manifestations. And if, uh, if fewer, uh, uh, if those were not all present, then it was deemed that the Castleman's disease, even though histologically present, was not uh, active, was in, in remission. I'd like now briefly to run through uh, the clinical and uh, features of the patients that we've looked after here at Chelsea and Westminster with HIV-associated KSHV related multicentric Castleman's disease. And we've had uh, uh, just under 100 patients. And the first thing to notice is that how uh, the, the majority of those patients, and increasingly the majority of those patients, have relatively good immunological function at the time the Castleman's disease is diagnosed. Most of the patients are established on effective antiretroviral therapy. And the majority of patients these days and even historically many of the patients have a well-controlled HIV viral load so that uh, so that actually immunologically they are relatively intact far more so than patients with uh, with uh, Kaposi's sarcoma okay and the other uh, feature to note is that it takes quite a lot of time in general to recognize what is going on and many of the patients have had symptoms for several months before a diagnosis is finally established. And the main clinical features of these uh, 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 patients with, with a pyrexia of unknown origin, basically with lymphadenopathy and heptosplenomegaly, and often very dramatic splenomegaly, so large that the medical students can feel the spleen even. Here you can see um, a nice uh, uh, a CT scan of one of our patients, and even I, I, uh, I believe this to be something called the splenic notch, which, uh, which is in the uh, um, clinical features to try and recognize that the lump in the abdomen is a spleen. I've never felt a splenic notch, but I think I've lied in many in exam and said that I was able to feel it. And here's a reconstructed uh, rendered CT scan uh, of another patient with Castleman's disease, showing just how many and varied the uh, uh, sites of lymphadenopathy. Often the lymph nodes are not enormous, but there are loads and loads of them throughout the uh, uh, throughout the uh, up uh, the mediastinum, the axilla, the neck, you know, and uh, uh, abdomen and pelvis. In general, the uh, these lesions are relatively high FDG avidity on PET scans. And uh, often uh, we use PET scans relatively early in the diagnostic algorithm to choose which gland to biopsy because uh, uh, with so many uh, enlarged lymph nodes, we can often go for the most FDG avid lymph node to confirm the diagnosis. 
as many as one in five patients have uh, pulmonary involvement at presentation, often with effusions and the uh, septal thickening, and also with ground glass opacification that can at times mimic uh, um, pulmonary uh, opportunistic infections. And a further perhaps one in 10 patients present with hemophagocytosis at their diagnosis. Here you can see some splenic uh, uh, sinusoid or cells phagocytosing erythrocytes and similar appearances here on a bone marrow uh, showing uh, um, phagocytosis of erythrocytes. Over recent years, the incidence of Kaposi's sarcoma has declined dramatically with the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. You can see this is a log scale, but uh, uh, over time, the, uh, the uh, improvement in uh, access to antiretroviral therapy amongst all of our patients has, uh, has shown, uh, has uh, um, resulted in a reduction in the instance of Kaposi's sarcoma. And indeed, the original START study showing that early use of antiretroviral therapy improved outcomes and that everybody should immediately be started on antiretroviral therapy following a diagnosis of HIV was really based around the reduction in malignancies, in particular Kaposi's sarcoma, in patients immediately started on antiretrovirals. Over a similar period, however, you can see that the instance of multicentric Carcinoma's disease has, if anything, risen. And this is almost certainly a combination of better recognition of the illness, but also because Carcinoma's disease is associated with intact immune function and often well-controlled HIV. So that there's not been the reduction of uh, cases of Carcinoma's uh, that has been seen in uh, in Kaposi's sarcoma. Prior to 2002, the median survival of HIV-associated KSHV-related multicentric Carcinoma's disease was appalling, with a median survival in uh, a, the largest published series from France of 14 months. And here of our patients prior to 2002, the median survival was only four months. But in around 2002, uh, both uh, the ANRS group and uh, our group at Chelsea uh, introduced uh, uh, immunotherapy into the management of Carcinoma's disease with treatment of rituximab being the cornerstone of the management of multicentric Carcinoma's disease. In patients with severe end organ involvement or, or um, a critical performance status, we also add here, we add uh, uh, chemotherapy to the rituximab for those very sick patients. And we would normally use etoposide, but if the patient has active Kaposi's sarcoma, which can deteriorate with the use of rituximab alone, we use liposomal anthracycline rather than etoposide with the chemotherapy. And that combination of rituximab with or without chemotherapy has made a very, very dramatic improvement in the overall survival of patients with a diagnosis of multicentric Carcinoma's disease, as you can see from this survival curve. And if you compare the pre-rituximab era with the post-rituximab era, you can see that the, the five-year survival rose from under 20% to over 80% a very, very dramatic improvement. And I'd like to just uh, uh, discuss with you the outcomes of those uh, 84 patients. Uh, the first thing is that there is an early death rate in these patients. So four of our patients were so sick at the time of diagnosis that they died early deaths on ITU, often before the rituximab really had any opportunity to, and chemotherapy to be effective. So the diagnosis was made and they were dead within a couple of days of that diagnosis. 
if you can get the patients off ITU, the survival is dramatically better. And if we then look at deaths from Castleman's, there's, we have, in our series of 84 patients, we've only got a single patient who has died of relapsed Castleman's disease. And that was at fifth relapse, having multiply be, been treated multiple uh, times, not only with rituximab when that stopped working with combination chemotherapy agents. So actually death from Castleman's disease is relatively uncommon as long as the patient has survived the first you know, week or two after the diagnosis. Nonetheless, we have had deaths in this group of patients and the other deaths are all attributable to lymphomas. And those lymphomas had Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus in the lymphoma. So they were either primary effusion lymphomas, both body cavity and extra cavity primary effusion lymphomas, or otherwise they were KSHB driven diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, so that that is even with the management with rituximab, there remains a vastly increased risk of, um, of lymphoma amongst patients previously diagnosed with Parsons disease. The other thing of note is that within 10 years of the initial treatment, at least a quarter of the patients had relapsed with further episodes of Parsons disease. The relapses usually coincide with the recovery of CD90, CD20 B cells following the rituximab therapy. So the B cells start to recover, I don't know, three or four years after the treatment with rituximab. And at the time of relapse of, uh, of the Parsons disease, the patient's uh, B cells seem to predominantly have recovered um, following the rituximab. And at, diag at relapse, the patients tended to be diagnosed a lot faster because they knew what to look for and, uh, and were familiar with the, uh, with the features of Carlson's disease. And almost all of the patients were successfully retreated with rituximab-based approaches when they relapsed. And some of those patients relapsed on multiple occasions and were suppressed with further and further cycles of rituximab. Uh, at each relapse. So I just got a couple of slides to, uh, uh, no, a bit, just a couple of points to uh, at conclusion, and then would be very happy to discuss any questions that you might have. The first point is that Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus related multicentric Parsons disease is a much easier diagnosis to make than idiopathic multicentric Parsons disease because the histological features are very straightforward using uh, when, when immunohistochemistry is applied. You can always detect HHV8 LANA in the plasmablasts, and the plasmablasts are always IgM lambda restricted. So actually, this diagnosis is relatively straightforward to a histopathologist familiar with those features. They're not fancy stains. The second thing is that the outcome for multicentric Carlson's disease in the context of KSHB was, was dramatically improved in the early two, uh, 2000s with the introduction of rituximab-based treatments. And, whether, and what additional treatment, whether you use etoposide or calyx, and whether or not some some people have advocated using anti-KSHV agents on top, although there's very little evidence that actually uh, improves the survival even further. But you know, whatever treatment is given, the survival is dramatically improved. As I mentioned, relapse is relatively common, but usually fairly straightforward and easy to treat because uh, uh, the features are very, very similar. You can use the uh, via the level of HHV8 in the blood, be it in the whole blood or in the plasma, as a monitor of disease activity. And it's almost always over uh, a thousand at relapse and at diagnosis and, and goes down with treatment, often to undetectable levels. 
And if the patient represents with symptoms and their HHV8 level in the blood has risen again, then that's almost pattern mnemonic of, uh, of relapse. Although I am very uh, uh, keen on always repeating the biopsy when relapse is suggested. And, and the reason I do that is because of the very high rate of lymphomas in these populations to exclude lymphoma rather than to diagnose relapse because the high rates of KSHV related lymphomas in this population. Okay, um, at that point, I'm very happy to take, you know, to open a discussion on the management of, um, of uh, these lymphomas, uh, the, uh, of uh, HHV related multicentric Carcinoma's disease. Thank you. Okay, in any case, we will have, uh, as I mentioned that at the beginning, the, the session is being recorded, so it will be implemented on both the EHA and the Euroblanet uh, e-learning environment, so everybody can have access to the presentation again, in, ca in case of doubts. So the increasing recognition of lymphomas associated with Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus will be a major feature of the, the, the WHO are rewriting the, uh, the um, classification of lymphoma, which they do every five years. And the new one will focus quite a lot on those KSHV associated lymphomas, which often are a consequence and follow a diagnosis of KSHV um, uh, Carcinoma's disease. Okay, well, I think uh, everything is looks clear for the audience. <laughs> so, so I just would like to thank you uh, for assisting to this webinar, despite all the technical issues, and for uh, for your uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, presentations, Professor Budbul and Boer. So if you have any question, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, you, can, uh, you can find this uh, webinar available on our uh, YouTube channel and e-learning environment. And um, I just uh, have to uh, say you goodbye and wish you a very nice afternoon. Thank you. So thank you very much for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.